Yeah, I've been at a number of these NAB shows. Every one is exciting, you know, to me. I see new technology, new people, new ideas, dreams. And really, the guys that we have here, Alec Tepstra right there, he's getting ready for his presentation, and then Dan Peck. These guys actually help people gain knowledge in so many different areas. And uh, go ahead and roll mine. Is it rolling here? And mine's quick. It'll be quick. And basically, I really focus heavily in my business as a World Teleport Association member on voice data video. But video is my specialty. Processing video, financing video plays, the ideas that people want to do, helping them bring that to fruition. And the attention economy is really what it's all about. Where can we find what people are interested in, what they want, when they want, how they want it. It's changing all the time. The beauty of what we have here today is we're going to talk about some of the critical factors that allow people to understand what are real analytics. And we have specialists not only in analytics here with Dan Peck and uh, Alex Hepster, but also the technology for tagging and tracking, harvesting. And remember, harvesting the content is what I used to do early on in my, my career with uh, Liberty Media. But processing it, how we gather that information and create real understanding is so critical to us today. So real-time analytics, and uh, let's see, Randall, I have some sound on here too, so you might want to plug that in. But we've got a lot of change going on. This is just one day. You know, this is just things we grab, you know, from one day, new websites that are coming up. Every day, some, some new idea, some window that's closing, but some guy just saw 12 new windows. And so here it is, you know, right here for us. So, you know, I think everybody sees the rich media ads, how critical those are as we bring those into media off the internet. Dan's going to talk a little bit about the effect of that and also geographical ads. Geographical ads down to the, ad, down to the zip code. So we can take the mobile information, harvest that information, and create access all over, all over the world and back into these models. So hopefully we're still playing here. Yeah, in my mind, one of the critical factors is how we encode it. The metadata, the, the uh, overhead data that we have allows us to track and process content, you, uh, provide usage algorithms that allow us to, to create uh, new models, new understanding, how to cross-correlate this information. Because valuation is critical. Can't finance anything in the media business without investors getting excited about it. We'd like to do some good ideas, but somebody has to pay the, for the freight. What's happening also is cloud computing. Cloud computing is another area that we have to be aware of. And in the teleport business, as World Teleport Association members, these are the platforms that we transmit to. So we do one encode, we smart encode it, and then we spread it out to the different platforms in different ways. Just did a real quick breakthrough here. This is going to just take a few seconds. I wish I could cover this, but I decided against it. So you're just going to have to watch it. And this is what's happening in the marketplace. In, in do T codes, things of that nature. All of this is critical. But this right here is what we're going to cover. This is what these guys understand and how to do it. What people want, when they want it, and how they want it. That's the basis of what we do in broadcasting. It's part of the attention economy that brings us understanding to maybe fulfill the dreams. Like I say, you bring a producer in, and what does he want to say? I have my concept, I have my art. And what do we say? You gotta make money at this. And that's critical. You know, so somebody has to pay that freight. I will keep on fighting till the end. I can walk on water, I can fly. I will keep on fighting till I die. And this is what we're doing at my booth, this live broadcast. We're bonding 3G into speed test this 5G. So when you're bonding 4G, it's amazing what you can do on the mobile side. Anyway, I'm out. Thank you. And now, uh, I'm going to turn the time over now over to, uh, I guess it would be Alan.
So, hello. I uh, hope you can hear me. Can you hear this? One more sound. Thank you very much. All right. So, I'm going to present a, a few slides. Uh, good morning uh, to you all, or good afternoon. Um, my name is Alex Terpsa, CEO of a company called Sevolution, a uh, fairly young company uh, in this space. And what we do is content identification, which is essential technology in the sector of what was just described here by Gary, in tracking and measuring content. You need to have the ability to identify content to do a very efficient uh, measurement. I'll present a few slides about that, and later on we'll have a discussion uh, on this. So what Civolution does is identify content, or at, you know, we produce technology that identifies content for a number of areas. We do that in, for piracy deterrence reasons, so we can track illegal content copies. We do that in media monitoring, which is basically the discussion of today. We do that in content monetization, where we can help monetize content assets on the internet by linking automatically business models to the, ab the ability or to recognize content. And finally, we also do that in media synchronization. We can help broadcasters, for instance, launch um, you know, very appealing applications um, that are linked to the main, the main screen, but actually are running on the second screen, for instance, an iPad or a like uh, device. Um, the company was formed uh, a couple of years ago in 2008, and we basically put together a couple of assets of three different companies, like you see here on the screen, from Philips Thompson and a company called Teletrax. And today, Civilution is uh, three and a half years old on its own feet. So we are leading in content identification, and I already mentioned that is um, increasingly important in measuring audience. Um, today, there is a lot of good measurements of audience or eyeballs, if you will, but most of it is platform-based, so it's kind of vertical. There are companies you know, like Comscore, a colleague here, then, who can measure very efficiently uh, content uh, consumption on the internet. There are companies that are measuring content consumption on broadcast channels, on mobile, very efficiently, but it does not create, let's say, one holistic view of how content assets are being consumed on multiple platforms or on multiple devices. Um, we believe that um, our technology can be helpful in achieving that in an efficient way. We talk about content-based measurements. So if you can uniquely and automatically identify content assets, and you can bring that ability into the content uh, measurement, the media measurement environment, um, then you can measure content assets independent from the platform, and you, you can create a holistic view of how content assets are being used. Um, you can do that with technologies that we provide, watermarking and fingerprinting, which are basically two slightly different technologies that have the ability to identify content assets uh, automatically. And I'm going to talk a little bit further about watermarking. Watermarking is a way to add a persistent identifier to a content asset. So basically, we hide a little bit of information inside the content itself, and it's all over the place. So once it's in, it's in, and you can't take it out anymore. That's the unique capability of watermarking. And basically, by adding that information to the asset, we make the asset unique because we give an identity to that asset. And that can be used for various applications, as I mentioned in the beginning. One of them is media measurement. And you can detect watermarks automatically by some detection software that can be implemented in a media measurement environment, which is important because now we have the ability to monitor content not only at the moment it is being broadcasted, which is basically the traditional way how it's done on broadcast channels, but we can also measure it in a time shift uh, way if you have stored your content on your PVR or you're using uh, some other internet services to watch the same asset. Uh, and the watermark is still there. We can still measure in the home the content that is being consumed. We believe this is important for broadcasters to really help them um, to realize this multi-platform strategy that most of these uh, companies are dealing with at the moment, which is a challenge in itself, to, to create this holistic view of how content assets are being used, but also advertisers, that is uh, extremely important. Advertisers want to have multi-platform campaigns and want to be able to measure uh, how their ads are being distributed over these multiple platforms. So content identification enables a cost-efficient way, cost-effective way of doing this, in a multi-platform environment. That's basically what I wanted to say as an introduction of what this type of technology can do. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Dan Piak. I'm the product manager for Comscore's video measurement products. Uh, and to give you a brief background on Comscore, uh, we are the independent third-party measurement source that agencies, publishers, brands, and marketers use to understand where and how to best reach their target audiences. So we do this by providing syndicated reports that help individuals understand the trending of the internet audience and how the whole industry is shaping out and sort of falling into place. So as we all know, the entire industry is kind of jumbling about right now because it's relatively new. I mean, this internet thing is only 20 years old. Um, and so what we do is help understand and provide the insights necessary to see how that's falling into place. Uh, we also do this by providing custom reports to uh, clients to help them really dig deep into a specific niche problem to help them understand how to find the best solution to reach their target audience. So I specialize in the video space, so what I'd like to do today is just take a few minutes to make it worth your while to listen to me and share some insights into how people are currently engaging with online video and then take a look at how that's translating to a cross-media environment where we have this concept of television in an offline environment and then the online environment and mobile and how those three different screens, if you will, are sort of joining together and coming together to synergize and really create the new form of mediums that we're going to be having for the next few decades. So I'd like to start off with a statistic, and that is that 173 million Americans are going to watch 31 billion videos this month. That's Actually, that's how much they watched last month. So that amounted to about 280 videos per person and 12 hours per person of just viewing time. So a lot of uh, the discussions over the course of the past few years has, have been revolving around, hey, is this video thing big? Is this video thing really going to become something that we have to be concerned about or think about? And the short answer is yes. Uh, the data that we see and the trending that we've observed is really the fact that everything is indicating that online video is growing and is growing rapidly. Uh, so this is something to get excited about, not something to necessarily be concerned about or how is this going to hurt our business, but rather it's an opportunity to say how can we use this to augment our current business strategy. So if we move that onto the advertising landscape, we can see that there were 5.9 billion video ad impressions uh, delivered last month, which amounted to 2.4 billion minutes and 148 million unique viewers who were exposed to advertising online. Pretty big. Uh, now obviously those numbers pale in comparison to the television world, but the statement that the, it is growing and it's growing rapidly is very true. So if we look at that, uh, over the course of the past four years, the number of video views has grown by 600%, and the ad spend has grown by 344%. So the, the monetization of online video and the audiences watching and consuming online video is growing, and it's growing fast. But why is it growing? If we look at why, I think the, the statistics that we like to focus on are really what makes online the online environment unique, and then more specifically, what makes online video unique. And the main things that we've sort of deciphered out of the data are that online video is an interactive, a lean forward environment. So people are, are engaging with it in a much more active sense than they would a television in their living room. Uh, and how the statistics show that are that one in three video viewers comment on a video. Um, so they're participating within this community and making comments, as I'm sure most of you have probably at one point or another commented on a YouTube video. Two in five regularly upload videos. So two in five individuals on the internet have uploaded videos. They've contributed to this community. They're giving back. You can't do that on a television. One in two regularly share videos. So in the way that a, a person sitting on their television might look, uh, go to their friend the next day and say, hey, this show is really good, you should watch it. That happens in an online environment too, but it happens much more immediately. You're watching a show and you hit the share button. You, sh you retweet it or you post an email uh, or a blog post uh, about the content that you're viewing. So it's very immediate. And then finally, two and three video viewers uh, online regularly watch video with others in the same environment. Uh, a lot of the preconceptions about online video are that individuals just sit at a computer and watch a uh, show and it's just by themselves at their office, at their desk, or just in their bedroom or, or their home office. That's not entirely the case. While that is a, a greater degree of viewing than would happen in a television environment, of course, uh, still two in three video viewers regularly watch with other individuals in an online environment, um, which is something that I think is, is what a lot of us didn't expect to find in the data, but the data shows what it does. So to, to backtrack just a little bit and sort of 
look at what spurred this really dramatic growth in online video, I think one of the main reasons is the real explosion of long form premium content online. So these are the television shows that were brought online. Uh, that really started happening in full force in early 2009 and we saw a very direct correlation to the increase in engagement and viewership of online video during that time. So we can treat the, the rise of long form premium television content being brought online as the catalyst that has driven a lot of increased viewership uh, in an online environment. So no longer has video been just a one time viewing of maybe a video of someone's cat on YouTube, but rather it's a destination for media consumption. And that paradigm shift is I think very important and something that is only going to continue to move uh, over the, in that same direction over the course of the next few years. And that's evidenced uh, by these statistics which say that video viewing on long form premium sites like Hulu or TV.com or NBC.com has really been growing pretty dramatically over the past year. 104% uh, in video viewers and 75% in videos per viewer. So the question then begs to be asked, if there's all this growth in online video viewing, are audiences shifting? Are they moving from an offline environment to an online environment and is this online thing cannibalizing offline? So let's look at some statistics. 6% of viewers who watch premium content online, watch it online only. So these individuals are the proverbial cord cutters. Uh, they don't have televisions that are connected up to anything that would give them long form premium content. They watch it all online, 6%. If we look at the whole pie, we can see that 24% are individuals who regularly watch content in an offline environment and an offline environment, but still 70% of viewers only watch content in an offline environment, television. Um, and now what we've been seeing is we've been monitoring this, this pie, if you will, over the past few years. And as would be expected, the orange and green segments are growing. Um, so these segments are really indicating the shift that is happening among audiences. And if we look at that by age, uh, we can see that, as would be expected again, the 18 to 34 year old demographic is more likely to be these cross-platform and online viewers than the 35 and up demographic. So uh, these are really indicative of many of the uh, early adopters in the crossing the chasm sense, uh, for those of you who are familiar with that analogy, uh, but the early adopters really are the younger demographics. Now all that being said, the statistics still show though the television audience sizes and television viewing times haven't decreased. So though we're seeing this increase in an online environment where individuals are watching more content for longer periods of time, it's this long form premium content, they're not watching less time on the television. So what that shows us is that the online environment is really serving to augment the offline environment and not to cannibalize it. And that's, I think, a very important takeaway because a number of us in the industry are very concerned about how is, how is this offline, online thing gonna, going to, to capture the offline environment or potentially take away from it. And the statistics show very clearly that that's not happening. So rather, online is an additional medium for content consumption that, again, is not necessarily cannibalizing the offline environment. Because as the statistics show, we're having a rise in viewership of both categories. Furthermore, if we look at the types of content that individuals say they prefer to watch on TV versus online, all individuals either preferred to watch content on the television or didn't have a preference among every content type. So the no preference categories were the lifestyle, lifestyle, home, celebrity entertainment, television content, reality TV. Individuals didn't have a preference online or offline. But all other forms of content, individuals still preferred to watch them in an offline environment. Now, we will be continuing to monitor this, but this is how individuals have currently expressed to us that they prefer to consume this content. So that's just some brief nuggets of information. Um, if you go to the Comscore site, you can find a whole bunch more information like that. Um, but really our role in the industry that we see Comscore as is the provider of the most accurate measurement for effective monetization. So if we can help the industry by providing the insights to you guys necessary for you to make the right best strategic decisions, we're going to help the industry as a whole, which helps us. Uh, and so that's the position and sort of the mantra that we like to hold ourselves to. So I'm going to take two minutes and go through exactly how we get this data. So how, how do we come up with all those statistics? 
So all of our PC-based measurement, uh, just from a technology perspective, is based on two sources of data, a panel source and a census source. So a panel source is our uh, panel of roughly one million individuals in the United States who we actively measure their internet behavior, behavior on a very opt-in basis. So they work with us to make sure that they are aware of what's going on, what we're measuring, and, presume, and, and in this environment, measuring video consumption. Then on the census level, which means everyone in the entire United States, actually globally, because we are a global company, I'm just focusing on the US here, but uh, from a census basis, we work with roughly 70% of all the top publishers out there today to actively tag their videos. So in their video players, whenever anyone in America watch, globally watches a video, that video player will have a little bit of code that sends us data so that we can get a census look at the environment that gives us overall tonnage and volume. But then the, we offset that and sort of add to that the panel aspects and the panel environment that we were able to gather. So demographics, how long they were viewing those videos, what their other behavior is. And we merge those two together to get this data. Uh, so some of the insights we're able to provide are Hulu had this many million videos and of those videos, that's a census measure, we're able to understand that on our panel, those viewers were 15% more likely to purchase things online because we can monitor all of our panelists' behaviors. Uh, and so the, the merging of those two sources is how we gather our data from a PC viewing environment. But really the future is saying, how do we look at this whole picture? Um, as Alex and Gary were saying, this is, this is all about the cross-media space. So it's not just about the PC, it's about all three of these uh, forms of measurement, the multi-screen approach. So what we're currently doing is really preparing ourselves for the future, and that is creating a 25,000 individual single source panel that joins together mobile viewing, PC-based viewing, and television viewing, and looks at how those three interact with one another to really get a full picture of what's going on. And again, because it's a single source panel, we're able to understand for a given individual how their viewing habits change as they move into the mobile space, as they move into the PC space, and how they really interact together. So this gives us an inf information about the duplicated and unduplicated reach across multiple media, and where some of the statistics that you were seeing earlier, with some of our very preliminary understandings of how this is, is working from our putting together this multi-screen panel. The timing and frequency of usage by target consumer groups, the impact of interaction between TV, online, and mobile advertising, and then finally, how the changes in the media mix that you guys uh, work with will impact what we all care about, which is uh, spend metrics. So that's Comscore. Uh, again, we have a number of those types of statistics, and our goal is to help you guys as much as possible make the right strategic uh, decisions for your businesses. Because if we can rise the tide, we're going to float all boats. Thanks, Dan. What a market. You know, and uh, great information. You know, and information is power. You have to move fast. Remember, speed wins here. Speed also kills. So who, who has rational ability to look at report data? Obviously, when the crash, financial crash affected, we had tremendous metrics, but who was rational looking at that data? And sometimes when we're trying to figure out the roadmap, the technology is so critical here. I mean, 84,700 seconds in a day. And believe me, I've, been a, I've owned a telephone company. We have to know exactly how to build this. So where people are, where they're, what they're doing, how they're making those calls, all that overhead data is cross-correlated, which is so critical. And I just have one question. You've got people here. We've got 130 teleports here connected you know, around the world under the World Teleport Association. We've got people looking for ideas. What would you recommend they do here with a final question? And, we, and we've got a role here. But go ahead, uh, Alex. What do you think, uh, what, as we look at this multi-screen arena, provide some counsel to people. What would you tell them to do? Of course, my, my viewpoint is from a technology uh, perspective. Uh, I, I think what's, what's, what's crucial is you need to know quickly, uh, efficiently, and accurately how content is being distributed through whichever platform, through whichever player, to the end of the consumer. Because that is really driving all of us. It's driving revenues in the broadcasters and the content creators, but also the technology companies that are out here. All of us were driven by that. And I think the fact that we are now all addressing multi-platform, multi-device with multiple services, that you have to get right. If you can't get it right, you can't make money. 
do you think? I, I would say categorically, don't trust your instincts, uh, which I realize sounds contradictory, but don't trust your instincts. Uh, a lot of what we discover and what I love doing is finding data that disproves what I would expect. So, hey, online video viewing. That's mostly young kids, 18 to 24, males. Not true at all. 85% of 65 plus age group watches online video. Wouldn't have expected that. So don't trust your instincts, but rather rely on the data to prove what you actually think. And that's how we bring money into the space. Because sharing with agencies and marketers and brands that, oh yeah, the young group is online, if you can't prove that statistically, it, the money will not move. Um, and what we've noticed is this market, from a monetization standpoint, is nowhere near what it could or should be. The market has exploded from a consumer standpoint, but we as companies haven't caught up. And the reason for that is because we're using our instinct and our gut, and we're not actually proving anything with statistics. And so I would say that that is my number one recommendation, without a doubt. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I think, you know, when I said this, you know, windows are closing. And every day a window closes, 12 new windows open up. And who can see that? You know, that's the question. Data gives us that confidence to really kind of work the financing we need to maybe bring forth some of these dreams. This conference exists because of ideas. We need lots of ideas. We need people to expose their ideas and generate new frontiers and horizon for the media business. Thank you very much.